Great reporting as always, Anthony. Go to lawandcrime.com if you want to learn a little bit more about the top trending stories. But we got to talk about the lunch ladies right now. And helping me talk about it is Law and Crime's very own Rachel Stockman. Rachel, great to see you. Jesse, wonderful to be with you this morning. I got to say, being a lunch lady, not an easy job. No, listen, you take a lot of crap from all the students. Yeah. So I don't blame these ladies for wanting to get revenge. Breaking the law, on the other hand, I don't know about that, Jesse. Now, I got to tell you, a half a million dollars? How on earth did they do this without anybody knowing? I mean, how much are chicken nuggets these days? I know. I was thinking the same thing, too. And apparently, the investigators believe that they could have even taken more. That's as much as they were able to trace them to, a half a million dollars worth of uh, money from, from school lunches. Do, Unbelievable. Do we know if they were just pocketing it, if they were, for example, if something's $5, they're really sneaking two dollars into their pockets I mean I think this was going on for years Is that I think how they, they were, were skimming it? in little little bits so that that authorities and our, their managers wouldn't notice and how did they eventually get caught um, uh, I actually don't know. They, I, I think it was one of their co-workers that might have uh, that turned them that in. Turned them in. So where, they're facing, I think, larceny charges in relation to this. Is there anything else you think that they could be charged with? I know that they've been released uh, from custody, but what else could you charge these women with? I mean, I do feel, I kind of feel a little bad for these sisters who. Yes, they took a lot of money, but can't we just say, hey, that's your, that's your pension? Well, I mean, they could certainly face some more serious embezzlement charges. And, I mean, I do feel bad for them, but at the same time, they stole a half a million dollars from a school district, from school districts that could have gone to children that needed this. So, I don't know, the sympathy on my end, I'm not feeling it, Where Jesse. does that lunch money go? It goes back to the school district and they could invest it in books and- Yeah, you know. I mean, it go, again, it goes to pay for food for the kids right. most of the time, so. It, pretty fascinating stuff. Now, I know they're defending themselves and saying that we're innocent of these charges. How do you think they're gonna mount the defense here? Um, well, I think that they're probably going to say that there's not enough evidence to prove that they're the ones that did the skimming. Oh, um, that's and that perhaps other lunch ladies were also involved in this. Perhaps they'll point the finger at, at the ringleader. Maybe this wasn't just a problem with these two lunch ladies. Maybe it was an epidemic of all the lunch ladies or men in the district. Who knows? I didn't think that this scandal would happen. I mean, it's pretty fantastic. Who knew so much was happening with lunch ladies and, and cafeterias? Now, they have they were released from custody if they're posting a $50,000 bond each. That's a large bond for both of them, and they were able to post it, again, claiming they didn't skim a half a million dollars. And then I looked at the bond, and I said, huh, $50,000 is pretty extreme, and they were both able to post it. What does that tell you? Yeah, I mean, maybe <laughs> these lunch ladies have some coffer somewhere and they were able to bring in money elsewhere besides just uh, the new Canaan school district. Well, I hope that we can cover this more if they go to trial. Hopefully, this is the cases. These are the hard cutting news that we want to cover here on Law and Crime. So if we ever have an update about this case, we'll let you know. Now, Rachel, stand by because the next thing that we're going to talk about right now is the Shana Huber's case out of Kentucky. I talked about it at the top of the program. Now, although we do not have live streaming, we now have the video from yesterday. And what I'm about to play for you is the prosecution's opening statement in this case from yesterday. And you can hear yourself how the prosecution really hammers away against Shayna Hubers, claiming that she is someone who is really a cold-blooded murderer. Take a look. God. Pretty powerful words right there from the prosecutor. Want to get the reaction right now of Rachel Stockman. Rachel, what do you think about what they're saying that you can't trust this defendant, we really going to believe and put the hands of uh, what really happened there in the hands of this woman? How do we believe what she really said? <clears throat> well, at, at the end of the day here, that's all the defense really has. Their, their defense is, that, of course, that this was self-defense, that she was an abused woman, and that she was fighting back, and he was about to grab a gun, so she was fighting for her life. 
I think it's going to be a tough sell to the jurors because yesterday we heard that 911 call. We heard some of that police interview. We can't play it yet, but we will as soon as we get it in here. Uh, I think it's going to be a very tough sell to the jurors that this was all done in self-defense, especially when you see her demeanor and you see how she acted after this happened. Yeah, I believe that the investigators first thought that this was a crime after hearing the words from the defendant herself and how it, she didn't seem not only not remorseful, but she seemed like she was happy to have done this. I mean, we can't forget the nose job comment that she made that she said her boyfriend was so vain that she always she gave him the nose job he always wanted by shooting him in the face. Here's what we're going to do. We are going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to always cover the Sheena Huber's case, but we're going to delve into the Jeffrey Willis case out of Michigan. Stay tuned. That is pretty chilling, listening to the words of a teenage girl who says that she was kidnapped by Jeffrey Willis. Back here with Rachel Stockman. Pretty unbelievable that she was able to testify and provide those statements. And the, we're not going to reveal the verdict about the Jessica Haringa case until much later on. But when you listen to that and the jury's listening to that, what is the picture that is being painted by the prosecution? All I can say is... I consider Madison Nygaard, the young woman that we just heard from, and I think we're going to hear more of her testimony, to really be a hero in all of this. Because at the end of the day, if she hadn't escaped Jeffrey Willis, if she hadn't run out of his car and gone to that neighbor, and we'll also hear from that neighbor, I don't think the police would have ever linked Jeffrey Willis to the killing of those two other women. And who knows, he could have done this to more women. So um, I think it paints a very chilling picture for them to actually hear from a real-life survivor of Jeffrey Willis. That doesn't happen often. And he was using so much of the same evidence, that same silver van for multiple crimes. We're talking about the Rebecca Bletch killing, the Jessica Herringa disappearance, and now this. It was the same car that he was driving and linked him to all these three separate events. Interestingly enough, um, the charges, the kidnapping charges related to Madison, they were dismissed because the family said, we've had enough of this guy. We don't want to see him in court anymore. Yeah, here's my theory about Jeffrey Willis, who actually spoke at the sentencing, too. Well, I don't want to give away the verdict, but I think I just did. Um, but this guy, he likes to be on trial. He l here he is sitting there. He's acting like he's an attorney. Um, and, you know, I don't blame them for not going, wanting to go forward with another trial. This guy is put away for life. Um, and just based on the, the previous trial against Rebecca Bletch. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, as much as we like covering it, really don't want to see this guy so much. We'll be back in a minute with more Madison Nygaard. This is something you never really see. You have a surviving victim testifying, a young girl talking about the moments when she was almost kidnapped. That could have been the end of her life. I want to bring back on Rachel Stockman to talk about this because the idea of a young girl surviving this is so amazing to hear. And yet do you hear the prosecution also trying to uh, cut into the defense's strategy of saying, oh, he was, he was just joking around. And uh, during the previous trial, uh, he actually took the stand and tried to tell the jurors that this was all a misunderstanding between this young woman and himself and that he was not trying to abduct her, even though as soon as she got in, uh, he locked the doors and he had a gun, um, that this was some kind of misunderstanding. But like I said earlier, the strength of this young woman to be able to get out of that car, she jumped, you heard her just then, she jumped out of a moving car. Um, and she was able to escape. It's really unbelievable to hear. Yeah, and, and when you, every time you look at a witness, you wonder, hey, are they credible or not? What incentive would she have to make this story up? And that is what makes this a tricky scenario for the defense, because what we're about to play you is when they cross-examined Madison Nygaard. Very difficult for them to do, especially this young witness. Let's see how they did. Break down exactly what the defense is doing there by cross examining this witness. And this is a very sensitive area and a very tough cross examination. Let's bring back on Rachel Stockman. So, saying, hey, he stopped when you got out, and uh, that statement that he tried to shoot you, uh, that was only later on that you came up with that statement. Are they doing anything effective here in the minds of the jury? I mean, they're really trying to get at her credibility and, most importantly, her, her memory. Um, I think. 
I think overall, if you listen to her story of what happened, in my mind, like you said, what would be her incentive to make up that a random guy abducted her while she was out walking in the middle of the night? There is none. So the fact that she has a hazy memory, and she was drinking that night too, remember? Oh, yeah. Um, that I, I don't think it's that effective to totally say her story is not true and that he was not trying to abduct her. Right, especially when you look at the evidence with the Rebecca Bletch murder <laughs> and the Haringa disappearance, things start to add up. When we come back, I'm going to play the testimony of Dawn Schmidt. This was the victim with Madison went right to her house and called 911. We'll be right back. Wow, that was just an amazing moment. We're listening to the words of this young teenage girl who was almost kidnapped, and then you also have the shot of Jeffrey Willis listening to the 911 phone call. Back here with Rachel Stockman. First question, what do you think is going through his mind as he's listening to that 911 phone call? Uh, what Jeffrey Willis is right. thinking? <laughs> I, I think that he realizes that this is some pretty damning evidence against him to hear. Like I said, you know, we hear from the woman we just heard some testimony before the right. break from Madison Nygaard. And, you know, the defense is trying to chip away at her credibility, at her memory. But after you hear that 911 tape of how upset she is, what, how desperate she sounds, there just is no way in my mind that the jurors are going to possibly believe that Madison Nygaard is making up the situation that somehow that this was a mutually understandable situation. There's just no way. Right. This woman was abducted. She's scared out of her life. That tape is so powerful. And, you know, I can't help but think that if it, you mentioned, we talked about it in the break, if it wasn't for her coming forward, what evidence would they have against Mr. Willis? If he never was convicted of Rebecca Bletch and you look at just the evidence in the Haringa disappearance, maybe there wouldn't have been enough to, co to, to go forward with the case here. I absolutely agree. If you look at this case that we're watching, just based on the evidence linking Jeffrey Willis to J Jessica Haringa's death, I do not think there would have been a conviction. It's a really interesting case, and we're just starting in the beginning of it. When we come back, we're going to play you more of that 911 phone call because it is so powerful and was so important for that jury to hear every word of this young woman testifying. And it, it, I mean, it's really incredible. And then a little bit later on, we are going to get into some more of the meat of the Jessica Haringa disappearance and see how the prosecution built their case against him. And also, when the defense tries to really hit on every little point and say, are you 100% sure that my client is the one that did this? Perhaps there's more out there. And then when we come back, we're also going to talk about the Sheena Huber's case out of Kentucky because yesterday was day one, and there's a lot to report from the opening statements. Stay tuned. And welcome back to Law and Crime, everybody. So before we talk about the Jeffrey Willis case, which is where we're revisiting today, there is always so much happening around the country. So here is a special report about the other news that is trending right now. Here are today's top crime stories trending on lawandcrime.com and across the country. Authorities in Iowa have released a map of the areas they are focusing on in the disappearance of Molly Tibbetts. The 20-year-old student from Brooklyn, Iowa, went missing on July 18th and was last seen going on a jog before her disappearance. The map highlights five locations, including farm areas, a car wash, and a truck stop. Investigators do not consider Tibbetts' boyfriend, Dalton Blake, a suspect and question the owner of a hog farm twice but have yielded no results. The ex-girlfriend of Buffalo Bills running back, LaShawn McCoy, sued the NFL player for his alleged connection to the beating she endured during a home invasion robbery last month. Delicia Corden contends McCoy or co-defendant to Marcus Jerome Porter, who also lived in the house, did not do enough to keep her safe in the home. McCoy allegedly pushed to have Corden evicted from his home, and Corden was attacked on the same day as the eviction hearing. McCoy has denied any involvement in the home invasion. A pair of sisters who worked as lunch ladies in Connecticut are facing charges after allegedly stealing over a half million dollars from the schools they worked at. 61-year-old Joanne Pascarelli and 67-year-old Marie Wilson allegedly stole the funds from schools in New Canaan over a five-year span. Investigators believe the sum of the embezzlement might be much higher. Both sister lunch ladies face charges of first-degree larceny by defrauding a community. Those were today's top crime stories. I'm Anthony Velez for Law and Crime.
Thanks, Anthony. Great reporting as always. Go to longcrime.com to learn a little bit more of the top trending stories of the day. But right now, I want to talk about Molly Tibbetts, this young 20 year old missing University of Iowa student who was last seen on July 18th. She was jogging in Brooklyn, Iowa. She was home for the summer, babysitting, uh, excuse me, dog sitting for her boyfriend at the time of her disappearance. There was a press conference earlier in the week. We here at Law and Crime had the opportunity to sit down and interview with uh, Angelina Salcido, a reporter from ABC 5 News. She explained a little bit more about what was happening in the investigation. But I want to talk with uh, Rachel Stockman about this. Um, one of the most disturbing things that I found out yesterday from speaking with An Angelina was the prevalence of a human trafficking ring in Iowa. I had no idea this was happening. Yeah, and you know what? The, the authorities, the police, the sheriff's department, they remain very tight-lipped on what's going on here. We found out yesterday that they've zeroed in on five areas in, in terms of their search. My guess is, Jesse, they have a pretty good idea of what happened, but they want to keep that away from the public because it could impede their investigation in terms of their questioning. Um, but it's frightening. This young woman just disappeared, vanished. There's some video of, uh, of her just days before she, she disappeared. A young, young woman, her life ahead of her, and I certainly hope um, that they find her alive, but it's not looking good. It's a horrible situation. We've seen this happen a lot of times before, and um, the results are usually not great, but we're really hoping for the best. Uh, one of the mo diff most difficult aspects, I'm sure, for investigators is trying to weed out the real reliable tips and the things that, uh, you know, because it's gaining such national attention from people who are just trying to call in and just call in. I mean, it must be really hard sorting out that information. Absolutely, because everyone is so concerned, but I'm sure they get a lot of bum tips as well about where she could be. False sightings, that sort of thing. Well, again, uh, if you have any information, there is a new um, website that we recommend you go to. It's called findingmolly.iowa.gov. You should go there or call 1 800 452 1111 if you have reliable information. Thank you very much on that one. We're going to switch gears ourselves, and we are going to talk now about the Jeffrey Willis case, which is where we were going before our last uh, break. And right before our break, we were playing you the 911 phone call from Madison Nygaard, this young teenage girl who claims that she was almost abducted by Jeffrey Willis. This is the 911 phone call she placed at the residence of Dawn Schmidt, a woman who was kind enough to open her door and let this young woman in after this potential kidnapping. And you hear in real time, the 911 call that she made, you hear the words and the, the fright that she has, the terror of almost being uh, abducted and killed. Let's play more of that 911 phone call right now. I can't get over not only listening to that 911 phone call, but watching Jeffrey Willis listen to it as well. Let's bring back on Rachel Stockman to talk a little bit more. You know, they, they, the reason they were able to bring all this evidence in was because to establish a pattern. Let's bring in evidence of Rebecca Bletch's murder. Let's bring in the investigation into this kidnapping. What is the pattern of Jeffrey Willis here? How is he searching out these victims? Well, it seems like, uh, you know, he's using the, his van and that it may be sexually motivated. He's abducting these young women who are often alone, that there's no witnesses around him. I think he obviously knew that Jessica Orango would be alone at this gas station and that the cameras uh, at the convenience store were not working. So he obviously had thought about this, knew the circumstances, and then, abdu and then abducted them. He it's scary. He admitted to being one of her customers, Jessica Haringa's customers at the gas station. Absolutely. What's kind of different, though, we were just hearing from Madison Nygaard, is that in that circumstance, and, and I think maybe this is why he got caught, Jesse, this was one of an opportunity for him. In other words, mm -hmm. there's no way he would have known at that time of night a woman would be walking down the road that he, that he could abduct. The woman that was jogging that he abducted, he probably saw her patterns and knew what she was doing. This woman, on the other hand, it was a random occurrence, so perhaps he was, he was off his pattern, and that's what caused him to be caught. And little did he think that when he was driving that van, that that young girl would be testifying him against him in open court. That is probably something he didn't expect, and let alone that we'd be playing it here on Law and & Crime and analyzing it ourselves. When we come back, though, we are going to take a break from Jeffrey Willis, and we are going to talk about Shana Hubers. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.
Wow, you hear the prosecutor explaining in graphic detail what happened to Ryan Poston. Really, really disturbing stuff. I want to bring back in Rachel Stockman. Rachel, you've covered a lot of different cases. Do you see this motive that the prosecution has been putting forth, this obsessed partner? Is that something you see a usual motive in these kinds of cases? Yes, we've seen that quite often. Um, again, emotions, love, it is one of the biggest motivators for something like this, a crime of passion. And you see her, the, the texting, the obsession, the jealousy. I really think the, the prosecutor is doing a very effective job of painting a picture of why she would want her boyfriend dead. Now, we are going to play you the defense's opening statement as well, but before we do that, the evidence doesn't lie. You know, you, you look at witnesses, you have to question their credibility. She shot him in the face. A shooting in the face is very interesting mm. here. Would you agree? Yeah, it's very... I don't know if intimate's the right word, but if you think about when you want to kill someone, shooting them in the face is kind of the most destructive, angry way to do it. Uh, if it was self-defense, why not shoot them in the arm or in the leg? In the face, that, that tells me in the head that she wanted him dead. She wanted him dead, and then as the prosecutor said, she went back and shot him six times in places she knew that she would die. Well, and according to her, that was in order to put him out of his misery because he was dying. Right. Well, this is not up to us. This is up to the jury. Um, I want to play right now the defense's opening statement. And the way they characterize their relationship is a lot different than what you just heard from the prosecution. Take a look. Wow, the defense is painting a picture of a very dysfunctional relationship, and we're going to have to see how they're going to be able to prove all of that, but I'm back here with Rachel Stockman. So what they're arguing is that this was all a product, this shooting was all a product of an extreme emotional disturbance. Is that really a defense here? What, that, that in part that, that led up to the situation where she felt like she was in fear for her life because Ryan was uh, gesturing towards a gun and she felt like she had to defend herself. Uh, listen, this, this strategy, the defense strategy that you just saw the defense attorney lay out here about these sex conditions, and we get into a little bit more Aaron Keller, who's... Uh, at the uh, trial has a article up on our website talking about how she was unable to orgasm and how that caused tension in their relationship and caused things to boil over. Very creative defense. I, I don't know it's, if it's going to work. Uh, it, it seems like a bit of a stretch, but obviously this was not a normal, good, healthy relationship. Jesse. I, I wonder how much of it is distraction, though, learning about the fact that she had to get a special shot in order to have an orgasm. While it's juicy details, is it really relevant to the shooting? Again, I think it's a lot of distraction. Um, I, I think it's certainly creative. I've never heard of this so-called orgasm defense before, but we'll see if it works. Um, th That's going to trend now. I <laughs> know, right? I mean, but, but really, what, what, what the defense has to establish is that she was in fear for her life and, and the self-defense. All of this is noise, right? They're trying to build a story of why she might have been in fear for her life. And we're going to have to see which way it goes. Rachel Stockman, thank you so much for coming on this morning and talking with me. Absolutely. All right, everybody. When we come back, we're switching gears. We're going to talk more about the Jeffrey Willis case. Stay tuned.